Uh, so how many people here are still trying to blame their hangovers on the altitude? <laughs> you keep it up. Honest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we had kind of an impromptu open bar last night uh, at the Poor House, and we're probably going to do something like it again tonight. So, uh, I don't know, follow Thunderbolt Labs. We'll tweet from there. Yeah, you'll, you'll find us. Just... So, can you hear? Yes? How's that? Camera. Good? I'm not going to put the mic in my mouth. It's not going to happen. All right, can I get a show of hands? How many, how many people here were uh, here for the previous presentation by Rich Kilmer? Okay, fantastic. I'm going to try not to get feedback, too. That's good. Uh, that was a really great presentation. And the way we set ours up is we want to go a little bit more advanced into the practical side of doing a RubyMotion app, uh, specifically doing client-server development, because that's, that's the stuff that really excites us, is combining mobile apps with uh, the cloud side. Now, we've got three, three parts to this. The first one is introduction to RubyMotion. The second one goes into the client server stuff. And the third part, the final part, talks about more of the why you would or maybe would not want to go with RubyMotion. So, and actually one other quick question. How many people here sort of actively are sort of develop client server APIs, you know, your JSON backend pushing something to like back, yeah. That's, kind of that's good. Yeah. So one of the nice things about that is like when you start thinking about client server applications, once you do that, it doesn't really matter whether the front end is a backbone app or, you know, pick the new JavaScript hotness. Serenade, maybe, right? or uh, an iOS app, they can consume the same JSON payloads. So it's a lot less work, and it's kind of important for reuse and keeping things pretty uh, separated. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all, introductions. My name is Tamar Sala. This is Randall Thomas. And together we are... Thunderbolt Labs. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> or is it Ebony and Ivory? <laughs> Ebony and Ivory. <laughs> Uh, oh, fun, fun little story. I actually wanted to name us that. He, he, he actually did try and name us that. I vetoed it as a PC thing. Yeah. <laughs> because I figured over the phone, nobody would be able to tell the difference between Ebony or Ivory. Um, oh, so that you laugh at. All right, fine. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Uh, and um, we're, we're going to have maybe some time at the end for questions, but that's not really how we want to do it. We like things a lot more interactive because we get really bored just standing up here on stage. So if you raise your hand, we'll stop, we'll ask a question, and it's much more relevant. So please don't be afraid to interrupt us. Yeah, or shout. Like, we might be like staring at the slides. So. Uh, by the way, raise your hand if you sat in this presentation just to heckle us. One, two, three, 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 three. Yeah, we <laughs> here we go, Rich. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> all right, so. All right, so first of all, just to set the, the stage here, you know, Randall and I, uh, and Thunderbolt Labs in general, we, we all have a wide variety of skills, um, all kinds of things that we're good at, right? Um, one of the things that we're not an expert in, to be honest, we're not iOS people, right? We, we're not Objective-C developers who are trying out RubyMotion. We are Ruby developers who learned the, uh, the Objective-C semantics and learned Coco through RubyMotion, right? So, that's kind of a caveat, that there are some deeper things in Objective-C. And Randall actually has a lot more experience with the deeper embedded stuff than I do. But in general, there is stuff that, you know, we're not experts on that. But it's the same um, approach that we think most people in the community are taking, where people are coming to this because they don't want to deal with Objective-C. Do, do a lot of you, anybody in the room actually have really deep Objective-C experience? Like most people, yes, no? Some? Right. Okay. Matt oh, raises, okay. Matt raises his hand back. Mike Clark. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing because he actually taught me iOS. I actually went to a Prague Studio course. You don't count. Yeah, and I still get to say that we don't know it, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're just saying that because you've seen my code. <laughs> All right. Um, so, anyways, what we're going to talk to you about today is Ruby Motion specifically for client server applications. That's what we're excited about. Um, so, first of all, let's talk about how you get started with RubyMotion, what it actually looks like when you're on the command line. Um, is that font big enough for everybody to see? <laughs> Not at all. Okay. Let's, let's bump it up. How's that? Better or worse? Yeah, I'll go one more and I might have to bump it down for other slides. I think that's fine. Um, so as you saw in the demo on the last presentation, creating a RubyMotion app is actually really simple. You, you just use the motion command, much like Rails, um, and you say just create a sample app. And it creates an app called Sample. And you've got your app delegate. And you can see this is Ruby code. We're going to get a little bit more into what the differences are in a second. Um, and then you just use Rake to, uh, to build and run the application in the simulator. Um, 
So here's a quick syntax breakdown of the, the, the differences with Mac Ruby and Ruby. And, and it was touched on in the last one, but I think we, we need to really hit this home, that um, th what you're looking at here, map view, pass in a map view, region did change animated, animated, is uh, that's the entire method. That is the selector um, with the crazy, like uh, sometimes you've got named arguments except for when it's the first one or whatever. That's all the method name, right? Um, and I have to bop, bop it down. Sorry, guys. Is that good enough for everybody? Yeah. yeah? All right, squint. Maybe it'll be all right. Um, so it's the same as defining this Objective-C method. And he's absolutely right. There is no bridge. You actually are defining that Objective-C method when you do that. Um, and it's not the same, uh, which is a little bit confusing when you're first coming into it, it's not the same as defining a method that takes uh, a hash of, uh, of options and passing in a, a one nine uh, hash symbol. It, it's not the same thing, which means um, if you define these two methods where the keyword on the second argument is slightly different, it's completely different method definitions. And if you call one or the other, you're actually calling different method definitions. You're not calling a method called map view and passing in different options. Right? So this is really important because if you aren't used to writing Objective-C, you're going to be spending a lot of time trying to figure out why something didn't draw until you realize that you're looking at the wrong method. So you know, watch out for that, especially as you get started writing RubyMotion applications. Right. OK. So. Uh, you I know what? Yes. Well, it, it will once it's actually out. <laughs> so, like you said, that's actually in. Um, that's EAP. Yeah, that's EAP. You can right now. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. So I have not used it, um, and we'll go into that in a second. Uh, but I guess it does recognize that syntax when you're defining methods. The actual, the only actual syntax difference with Ruby is in the method definition. When you say def whatever, and you pass in and the keyword inside the method definition is not legal Ruby. It is legal Mac Ruby, and that's what this is based on. So I'm going to go back, uh, point that out right here. So this region did change animated. That's the bit that if you tried to do that through a normal 193 Ruby app, it would be like, I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about, right? Uh, do you guys have a beeper for me? <laughs> you're going to need that. Um, OK. so. One of the cool things that came out recently in just in general with iOS development, um, and, and well, actually in general with uh, Apple development, iOS and OS X development, is the concept of storyboards. Who here um, has used nibs uh, in developing OS X apps? Who here who uses storyboards? Who here has cursed nibs when they were developing <laughs> it? And remember when they tried to improve it by serializing it to XML? Because that really made things really readable. So, Storyboards are actually a really cool concept. I'm going to give you a real quick rundown of how this works. Um, basically, you drag UI elements under this palette, and you kind of draw out what you want things to be, and then you save it. And unlike other systems, like I think how Visual Basic works, it generates code that would create that UI. Instead of doing that, it actually instantiates objects into memory. That, um, that are those, those view elements. And when you save it, it actually marshals them down, basically like a memory image of this is what your view is. And when your application launches, it loads that nib, tosses it into memory, and sets up some connections between your instance variables, your outlets and your uh, selectors, I think it's called. Right? Yeah. And how many people here have forgotten which direction they need to drag their IB outlets to? Oh, holy shit, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I hate that so much. It's, it's, it's pretty painful, but storyboards actually make that a lot easier because it actually, especially with the new storyboard editor, it's much easier to hook things up and test it than it was in some of the old iOS simulators. Um, right. With these storyboards, each one of these little boxes that you're seeing, um, and I know they're kind of hard to see. Let me see if I can bump it up. Oh, no, that just does the font. <laughs> it's, it's an image. Trolled by my own computer. That's great. Um, each one of those boxes is uh, uh, an iPhone screen. And you're connecting them together by dragging from the button of one to the next box. And you can actually run that. Yeah. It's like director for iOS, right? Because <laughs> we all knew that was a really good Look, idea. Look, I'm back a programmer. So you can actually run that, and it'll run through this entire thing. You just click these buttons. It does nothing, right? But it's great for rapid prototyping and showing, like, this is what I think the app's going to do. And you can sell it for 99 cents in the App Store. Right. It's pretty cool. <laughs> So storyboards are pretty cool, and you can actually use them with uh, Ruby Motion. 
uh, you basically you end up creating a storyboard in your resources directory and you use Xcode to do that. You change your break file so that the UI main storyboard file is set to the name of that storyboard. Then um, you make sure that for each element in your form or whatever you're gonna be using, for each element you make sure that it has a, a unique tag. So I have to click on this password box. I have to click on the, what is that? shovel? I have to click on the shovel and then I have to go over to the um, view and set a unique tag on there. And the reason you have to do that for each one of your elements is because in your UI view controller class, now notice this is just Ruby here, like we're using Ruby motion, um, you have to set up methods that will grab that item out of your storyboard. So you have, because you're a UI view controller, you have a method called view that basically points at your, your your, what do they call it, pain in the storyboard? Yeah. It is painful. Um, so you can say view a tag one, two, or three, and now you've got it, right? That's the hard way of doing it, and that's how you had to do it for a while. Question? question? Yeah, just add, which one associate those add Oh, okay, we're, we're gonna get to that in a second. So what, <laughs> you, you're, you're right, you would probably wanna put some constants in there uh, you probably want to put some constants in it. The problem is you can't set those constants in Xcode. Okay, so one thing we actually need to be very clear about is you are no longer in Ruby land. This is actually a very nice illusion over a horrible, horrible dream, right? <laughs> so what you should think about this is like, um, uh, like that scene in the wall, you know, where you're being chased by hammers and like your teacher's like, like going over the cliff and everything's all horrible. Or Brazil, which is another horrible movie which has these terrible, terrible nightmare scenes, but at the end he's like flying like a bird and an angel and it's cool. This is like the angel scene. Behind the scenes, you still get these ugly little things that poke their head through. And one of them is like, you know, having written a lot of C++, we have defined statements all over the place and macros. So shit like this doesn't bother us because, you know, we started writing code in the 80s and in the 80s we did this shit. It's cool, right? So yes, you should, but you're not in Ruby land anymore. So do it their way. It's much less painful. <laughs> and, and there is now this gem, which is actually really nice. The IB. Yeah, yeah IB, um, which helps out. It's such a hack the way it works though, it's really incredible, but it's, it's the only way that really works well. So which is... anybody here who doesn't like hacks, cover your ears, <laughs> like seriously. So please, elucidate how this works. So you, works. In, you include this gem, and we're gonna show how to do that with using Bundler in a second. Um, and then you, in your UI view controller, you extend it with IB. And then you've got access to these methods, the like outlet, basically. And you can say this view controller has an outlet, which kind of means an instance variable that can point to part of the view, um, named email text field or name text field or button. Those are my outlets, right? Um, oh, sorry, I didn't. Oh, yeah, and down there at the bottom, you run rake design. What happens when you run rake design is really fun. So IB looks at um, all the, the classes that have extended IB and generates fake header files as though they were Objective-C classes. Uh, then it creates a temporary Xcode project, tosses those header files into there, launches Xcode against that project, and I think it creates a storyboard. You might have to manually create a storyboard, storyboard for that project. And then you can drag from the storyboard into this fake header file. So how many people think that that's great? Come on, it's, come on, it's genius, it's fantastic. <laughs> What? If you change code in the header, of course, that goes nowhere. You know, so you don't guys do that. Been spoiled right. by Rails console, Rails DB, <laughs> rake test. It is worth it to be able to use the magic that is storyboard. Now, Rich showed some gems that um, are being written and worked on in order to give you this kind of DSL for making and designing interfaces. I've played around with some of them. I have not found any of them to be nearly as natural or uh, or easy to use as storyboards. One of the benefits of storyboards, for example, is that I can hand it to my designer and say, just make it look pretty, right? And they can do whatever they want to that as long as they don't uh, screw up the um, associations that are set up and we're all good, all right? Um, okay, so the next thing, that's too far, is uh, Bundler. So we have a blog post. You can follow that URL to get that blog post. We're gonna put these slides up or tweet about them so you don't have to write any notes down right now. Um, or you just search Ruby Motion Bundler and you'll probably find that blog post. Um, it, including Bundler and Ruby Motion is really easy. Uh, basically, you just modify your rake file. So you do uh, require bundler and then a bundler.require and it uh, loads all of the, um, 
loads all of the gems that you have in your gem file that's in your, your repository, just like you would with a, a Rails application. So now you can use gems like bubble wrap and things like that that are built for Ruby motion. You can also install the gem uh, Cocoa Pods. So in here, we've got our gem file that has the Cocoa Pods gem set up. And then once we have the CocoaPods gem, CocoaPods is like a bundler, like Rich went into this a little bit. CocoaPods is sort of like uh, a Ruby gem system for uh, iOS development, or for Objective-C development, right? Um, so we kind of bootstrap from Ruby gems into CocoaPods into, now we can define these pods here. And here we've got a couple of pods defined, like RESTkit and uh, Cocos 2D, things like that. Um, when I looked at the specs, you know, Rich said there's 600 pods. When I looked at the specs uh, about three months ago, I think is when I, when I looked last, there was about 450 pods. Yeah, it's that's probably we, grown since then. Yeah, so. that's why we put and counting. We were actually too lazy to really check yeah, them over there now. Very. Lots. <laughs> um, but Cocoa Pods are great uh, because it used to be the case you had to download the, the code for an Objective C library and uh, dynamically link it into your app. And Cocoa Pods takes care of all that for you and dependency management and everything you expect from a package manager. Right? Okay, so now let's look at a couple of uh, iOS patterns and how they look when you're using Ruby. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not focusing too much on the Cocoa framework because we want to get more into the, uh, into the client server stuff. So let's look real quick. One of the things that you have to do differently if you're used to being a, a Ruby or especially a Rails developer is you have to think about um, mobile development very differently. You have to think about memory, right? So one of the patterns that's built into uh, map view controller and also table view controller and a few others is that it will automatically try and reuse components for you uh, in order to save memory and not um, constantly be allocating stuff. So that's really hard to see, so let me try and bump it up here. Um, in here what we've got is a map view, view for annotation, right? And we first try and DQ a reusable annotation view with identifier. Oh my, I love Coco so much. Um, and then if we get that view, then we set the annotation and configure it however we want. Um, and that's for a little flag that shows up on a map, right? If we get uh, one, then, it, then that means we have one that's no longer visible on the map area. We can reuse that. So let's use that. Um, if we don't get one, if that's nil, then that means we just have to instantiate a new one and we give it the, when we instantiate it, we tell it what the identifier is, view identifier we're using, and it just goes ahead and uses that. So it keeps kind of this queue of recently seen annotations when you're scrolling around the map, and if you need to show a new annotation somewhere else on the map, it'll just reuse that because it needs to pay attention to memory. So one other thing to note, especially because we're all lazy, is you have a tendency to cut and paste these DQ reuse with blah, 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 blah identifiers. Make sure you change the reuse identifier. Yeah, you'll get some really fun behavior if you don't change that reuse identifier. Yeah. Good times. Um, delegation is another pattern that's very popular, very popular in, um, in the Cocoa library. Uh, who, here, uh, has, who here knows the, the delegation pattern as Cocoa uses it? Uh, okay, about 10%. Um, so basically what delegation, the way that Cocoa uses delegation is um, if you have, if you're using a Cocoa library uh, component that it doesn't have enough information to be able to do everything it needs to do, you give it a designated delegator that it constantly calls back to with predefined method signatures saying, hey, can I do this? Or hey, this happened, what do you want me to do, right? right. It's like 99% of the time that delegate is actually yourself as the controller. Um, so yeah, sometimes it isn't. Yep. I mean, I think the way that they normally describe it is don't call me, I'll call you. Right. right? And it's good object-oriented design. And um, in general, actually, I learned a lot of, about really good programming by reading this book, um, uh, Coco Design Patterns, that yeah. came out recently. It's Very good book. Yeah. Um, so anyways, you can see here that for the table controller, we've got two delegate methods that we've defined. One is um, table view number of rows in section. It gives us the section. And basically that's saying, how many rows do you want me to display, dude? And the second one is table view cell for row at index path. And that says, give me the view that should represent that, or give me the cell that represents that view at, at, at that space. Basically tell me what to draw when I'm drawing this cell. 
Inside that method, by the way, it also uses that same memory management pro, uh, pattern that we saw earlier, where it tries to reuse those cells whenever it can. So as you're scrolling through a table view, when they go uh, off the screen, it'll try and reuse them as you need new ones. But, uh, but yeah, so that is the delegation pattern. Now delegation, um, Delegation was also there at the time because Objective-C uh, didn't support lambdas. It didn't support uh, anonymous procedures, right? So, you, so when you, whenever you had even a single method that you needed to, to act as a callback, um, Objective-C forced, or Coco forced you to define a delegate that was usually yourself, and then whenever something fired, it would call back to you. Now Objective-C supports uh, blocks, and Ruby Motion makes use of that by mapping Ruby blocks directly to Objective C blocks, if I'm not mistaken. So here's an example of using UI views animation stuff. Um, you can say animate with duration, and then animations, you give it a, a block, a lambda, and in there you define what you want the animations to be and how you want them to work. And then when it's completed, it calls this other lambda uh, that passes in a finished flag or whatever. And then you can do, you can move on at that point. Uh, much better than the delegation stuff. The, the times that you still want to favor delegation is when you've got like, uh, 20 methods. You don't want to be passing in 20 blocks into a method call. So instead you pass in a delegator, which is usually yourself, and then you define all those methods and it's, you know, it's a good pattern. So one of the things to note here is anybody, how many people here have actually played around with Xcode, Objective-C, like most? So how many people have actually keep the Objective-C documentation open while they code? Every hand should go up, right? Oh. Because nine times out of 10, if you're curious on how you do something, you need to look up what the delegate is for that application, right? Because the delegate is basically where you get to hook in your behavioral code. Um, if you start doing things and start messing with base classes or starting deriving from things, you're probably doing something wrong and it needs to go into a delegate, All right? Okay, so now let's get into the client server stuff. <clears throat> um, the first thing I wanna show you guys is a library called AF Networking. AF Networking is a low level, um, HTTP library written by the guys over at Gowalla. And basically they looked at the, the NS, uh, what is it, NS URL connection, NS, yeah, I think. NS URL. Um, and they looked at it and they said, this is not good enough. There's a lot of things that it does wrong. So AF networking does a lot of things right. For example, it takes care of streaming. You can do progress monitoring. You can do authentication. You can, um, uh, all of the operations are actually implemented as NS operations, so you can throw them into an NS operation queue. They all get run in the background, I think via uh, GCD. Yeah, GCD, Grand Central Dispatch. And then you can pause and resume them and things like that. I believe there's caching built into it. And you also get sane success and failures. Uh, the built-in Coco networking stuff, uh, I don't know when it gives you a failure, but it's not based upon the return code that comes from the, from the server. This actually does failures based on the return code from the server, which is the way it should be. It's a really great net, uh, library, and it's one of the reasons why the, the CocoaPod system and, and the um, Objective-C ecosystem is really cool, because they, they have to be more concerned with correctness and memory management and stuff like this, and this takes care of a lot of stuff for you. Um, it's real easy to use AF networking. Let me bump that up. That's about good. Um, one of the nice things it does is it builds as much as possible on the existing Coco stuff. So first we create a URL, which is a normal NS URL, URL with string, hbsurl.com. Uh, and then we create a request, an NS URL request, that's also still just regular Coco. Um, and then we have this operation. AF JSON request operation, JSON request operation with request. Oh my God, I love you. Request success lambda, okay, yeah, I get that, and failure nil, which, because I don't care if it fails, who cares? Um, <laughs> another question, yeah. Yes, uh, Matt's here actually, uh, there you are, who wrote Bubble Wrap. Uh, Bubble Wrap is based on the original Coco networking stuff, if I'm not mistaken, which has all of the, the problems that the, uh, the last slide showed you. So yes, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is actually what you want to use. As far as I know, well, I mean, the problem with, with the iOS community is that you don't see into a lot of applications as much as you do inside the Rails community or the Ruby community. There's a lot more transparency in the Ruby community. but. Um, I'm willing to bet that very few people actually use the, the straight Coco networking stuff. AF networking is very popular. Wait. Go ahead. Just one more question. Do you just have any people who have any networking? Because it's more features, the AF 
Got it. Yes, yes. AF networking is also built on top of the same, same Cocoa APIs that Bubble Wrap is using. But AF networking adds um, the operation stuff, right? And it adds sane response codes and things like that. Um, it also returns straight JSON. You can see that the JSON, this is, the last thing here is actually JSON. It's, it's already decoded for you. Um, there's something else I was going to say about that. Also, one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, That's yes. what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings up kind of a bigger thing that um, we're going to touch on later as well. But yes, there are a lot of really interesting Ruby libraries that really abstract away what the Cocoa framework is. Um, but if you ever think that you might need to migrate away from Ruby Motion, God forbid, or if you want to see more examples from the community of like, oh, how do I fix this issue? Um, relying upon the kind of the native libraries is a very good idea. Yeah, so just so you know, once again, part of the problem is that this stuff looks like Ruby, but it isn't. It's like, and it's really funny. I remember we were looking at some code samples, Tara and I, and I'm like, I got to the end and I didn't realize until I'm like, you're missing a curly brace. And he's like, no, dude, this is Ruby. Right, you have to think, you still have to think in, a, in Objective-C, basically. Right, so it, it's always better to be able, to, the other thing is if you look at the examples, most of the examples that you'll want to translate into Ruby Motion are actually written in like the, basically the OS 10 developer library, the developer notes have a lot of really great examples and they're like really neat zip libraries. So a lot of time you just download the code just to see how they do very small functions. So in order to be able to translate it from Objective-C into Ruby Motion, you need to be able to sort of be comfortable with, unfortunately, as long and ugly as those, those method calls are, yeah. to kind of figure out what the name of that method should be and how it actually translates over. All right, and AF Network is also built for subclassing, which makes things really nice. So you can actually define, um, I call this my client. They have example clients for Twitter and for app.net and stuff like that. But basically, um, once you define this class, that subclass is from the AF Networking client, or AF client, I think it's called, then it's very easy to get a URL and just parse the JSON right out of there from anywhere inside your application. Okay, so the second thing I want to talk about is SD web image. Um, it's caching asynchronous image downloader. Um, and this is just written by some dude, uh, and that's the URL right there. Um, here's the, when I first wrote a Ruby Motion app that had to do a table view with some images in there, um, this is the code that I used to populate the images from URLs in the table view, from S3. Um, now, this is, we just said, this is what you're not supposed to do. Who here knows Matt, why? you can't answer. Yeah, Matt, Matt you cannot you can't answer. answer. Who here knows why this is a bad idea? Raise your hands. All right, one back there. Yes. So it's to a repeat what he process. said, the call is blocking and your world will just freeze and horrible things will happen. People are dying. I'm paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> so they, 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 you know, there's, there's mobile apps for uh, medical stuff. So when yeah, you download might die, things you know? synchronously, God kills a kitten. And this is, this is an important thing. This is one of those things that it's like you're not used to this with Ruby, with Ruby and Rails no, development. No, that's not true. We have that thread class, remember? <laughs> That, 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 that thread class in Ruby. There, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been writing big Rails apps, then you're like, okay, I need to worry about how many backend hits I'm doing. I need to use promises. Or I need to you know, make them concurrent. Uh, maybe return status to the client or something. If you're doing a lot of JavaScript work, eh, still less so. You have to worry about blocking with, um, with iOS application development and OS X application development, you seriously have to worry about this stuff. Any block is just you know, a zero rating on, on the App Store, right? So, so this is bad because, like he said, it'll block for each image, sit there for uh, two seconds while it loads it from S3, populates it, goes on to the next one over and over again. Really great. Um, uh, basically, you get the, the giant beach ball of death, right? And I don't know who this hippie is, but um, I think we'll pro we're probably going to hire him. Um, okay, so this is SD web image, um, and this is how you use it here, and it's really easy. Um, all you do is you, you include it via um, CocoaPods, and we already showed you how to do that. And then, again, you just get a regular NS URL, this Cocoa, uh, Cocoa URL. And then here you also uh, do a placeholder, a local image you're going to use while it's loading it. And then it adds a method, set image with URL, onto your image view. And so you give it the URL, you give it the placeholder, and it just it does it. It's just like magic. Um, uses a background thread or maybe GCD, and just loads it, um, loads them all at the same time. So it works really well, very easy, 
it's like a no-brainer. So uh, we've mentioned this a couple times. Does everybody know what GCD is, Grand Central Dispatch? You've heard about it. Like, it's not some mysterious thing. I'm not seeing a lot of hands go up. OK, thank you. Do you want to? Oh, no. I think people, OK, for those who don't know what GCD is, GCD was actually a way to do dispatch and get callbacks by actually assigning blocks in C, which was not a native feature of C, right? So it's a very efficient way. It's a, basically, it's supported by uh, OS X and iOS. It actually has operational cues that you can put uh, essentially a callback method in to be executed in the system worries about scheduling it. It's much easier than doing threads. Right. So a lot of times you'll end up using GCD instead of doing a thread if you want to do like a regular running process or something like that. So it basically greatly simplifies things that you would ordinarily have to do in a threaded or multi-threaded environment. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the big one. This is the, this is the mother bomb of all like how you do client server stuff um, with iOS and it's called RESTKit. It's built on top of AF networking as of this new version. And basically, it's an HTTP JSON ORM. Um, and it's written by the guys over at GateGuru, and it's a wildly popular library, something you could really depend upon. It's also now a moving target. Fun, fun, fun. So um, within about two months, RESTKit 0.20 is going to drop. And as you would expect from a point release, uh, it changes everything. So. Um, this, this presentation is focused on the new API of RESTKit 0.220, which is, like I said, I think it's going to probably drop in about two months. It's hard to say. There's a development branch going on uh, that is almost 100% different. It's good times. Um, but RESTKit is really nice. It's very easy to use, and it's a very clean division uh, from an object-oriented point, point of view, and it's really good. Basically, you write um, a PORO. <coughs> I knew you were going to purchase this. <laughs> God, God what? God damn, damn. <laughs> you write a plain old Ruby object. Or, or, uh, Jesse did a presentation on Maglev and just ripped into anybody like who calls it Poro, so you know, go fuck yourself, Jesse. Um, and then you tell RESTKit what JSON to map and how, and then you get a URL. And like magic, RESTKit goes through all the way back and returns to you your plain old Ruby objects, which is really nice. Unlike Active Record, you don't have to write your your classes, you have to write your models such that they know about active record. Jesse, you better plug your ears for the next three slides. There is no system in Ruby that can persist classes like this when they don't know about, uh, okay, moving on. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you write a, a, a Poro, and um, here we got just class person with, with two attributes. Everybody, everybody's Ruby, everybody knows what that is, right? Um, and here's the JSON that we're going to get back from the server. Uh, this is... By the way, anybody? Anybody? Come on, read the data. <laughs> I didn't think anybody would get that. I'm touched. Classic of sitcoms. <laughs> yeah, creepy. Um, so this is the JSON that is... Actually, can somebody help me out? Is this the standard JSON that's returned from Rails when you get slash people? Yes. This is not the active model serializer JSON. Right. Okay. I use. Any, by the way, who here has used Jose Villem's active model serializer? Seriously? Holy crap! It is so good. It's perfect for JSON uh, servers. It's beautiful, and it makes everything clean and nice. Anyways, so this is the JSON we're going to get back from the server, and we already know this ahead of time. We don't need to control that. Um, and now we just tell JSON what JS or tell RESTKit what JSON to map. It used to be easier; it was like half the lines of code. But with the new version of RESTKit, this is what you have to do. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. This is your app delegate. This is the main god class for your entire application. It's called the app delegate because it is set as the delegate for your application. So whenever, whenever your application needs to ask a question, it asks your app delegate. It's also usually the junk drawer for, oh my god, I just need something global, right? So the other thing is, how many people are starting to see exactly how C-like Ruby development can be? Yeah, it, it looks like I'm developing Cocoa, right? Sorry, uh, Objective-C. Um, so what I hear, have here is in, and this is actually, this is not the cleanest way of doing it. You should be pulling it out into another server class, but I, I'm just doing it here to make it easy to illustrate. Um, in your application did finish launching, you, or with options, you um, get a URL for the back end, set it to um, an accessor called back end that we have set there, and then you add a couple of mappings. Um, you have this person mapping, which over here you've got this hash, 
It says, for the class person, map it with this dictionary. ID maps to remote ID and name maps to name, right? And then I um, add that mapping for uh, all successful response codes and um, with a pass in the mapping there and then I add that descriptor to the back end. It's complicated, but it's much more flexible than it used to be. So it's actually, it is actually a win, believe it or not. So up here you can see me calling it. So basically I'm saying if I ever receive anything that's, that's got the, the key person, then assume that whatever's after that is going to be for the person class and map it using the ID to remote ID name to name mapping that I passed in. Same thing if I ever receive something plural, people, assume that it's uh, part of that class and map it in the same way. ResKit takes care of the fact that one is a singular and one is a, uh, an array. ResKit will just take care of that, it'll figure it out. It assume, assumes that they're all people, right? Then I just get an arbitrary URL. That's the wrong direction, there we go. Um, so here we're in some other view and when it appears, we go ahead and initiate a, uh, a network request. Uh, here I'm using app.delegate, that's actually a, a bubble wrap feature, um, one of the nice ones there. And I'm asking the back end to get objects at path slash people and I'm not passing any extra params, although I could, it would just be a hash. And I get a success lambda and a fail failure lambda. And once, once those callbacks trigger, then I can modify my view to, uh, to have all the rest of the stuff there. And it returns your models like magic. So inside that success lambda, you have operation and result. I don't even know what you're supposed to do with operation, but the result, if you call. I think the operation is the operations queue. I think it is the operation queue. So then maybe I could requeue it, say, no, I want to do it again, or something like that. I don't know. Um, but the result.array returns the array of person objects. If I know that I'm getting what should be a collection, then I'm going to call result.array. If I know that I'm getting what should be a single uh, instance, then I call result.first object. And it just returns me the first one um, if there's any in there. And that's, that's the basics of ResKit. Um, you can also, that's, that's for just reading, you can also go into full CRUD and here, uh, how much time do I have, seven minutes, no, that's not good. Okay, I'll speed up a little bit. For full CRUD, uh, we have to, so first we told it how to map stuff when I did, when I get a response. Now we have to tell it how to map back if I'm doing a request, right? So we say add request mapping, which is a method down here that uses that same person mapping, this is the same method we had before, and reverses it saying, well, just map it backwards, right? And um, tells it what, what the key should be, which is person, and that's it. And from that point on, we can also do, um, well, and then also, sorry, because now you're doing a full CRUD, you could just have your app embed all these arbitrary URLs throughout the application. That gets really messy, so ResKit includes a routing system as well. So I could set up a get route, a put route, a delete route, and a post route for, um, for the person class and I tell it what the pattern is for that URL and it'll, it'll ask uh, the person for remote ID to fill out that URL when it needs to. And then I just add them all to the router and then uh, it's as simple as saying if I want to create a new person then I just say post object person and it'll post it with the correctly nested um, attributes for a Rails application to consume. Um, or I can update a person and again, because this is the update method, we told it that the, the path has remote ID, so it'll ask, um, it'll ask the person what its remote ID is and figure it out. So it works really well. Will it fill in an underscore method? Say again? Will it fill in underscore method for Rails? Oh, um, no, because you don't need to with Rails. Rails only has underscore method in the forms because browsers themselves cannot understand put. But once you hit Rails as, uh, no, this is a put. But if you, but this is via an API. So once you, if you do a put to Rails, you don't need underscore no, method. It's, it's actually talking about the typo. Oh, do I have a typo? Post, yeah, because we put post on the bottom. Oh, thanks, put. jackass. Uh, yes, so sorry, typo. I'm supposed to say put down there, thank you. We told you um, to shout out questions. I was gonna show a demo, but I'm really running out of time and I wanna get into the more important, um, ResKit can do, um, it, the demo was really simple. Just a table view, reading, writing, um, it'll actually be, available later. Um, it, ResKit can do more, it can do object relationships, so people has, have many tasks and you can you know, do full CRUD on those. It does core data, it does some caching, you can do image uploading and all kinds of stuff like that. It's a really powerful library.
the big question that probably everybody really came to talk about is, is Ruby Motion worth it? So first, let's talk about some of the bad aspects of Ruby Motion. Um, so uh, Rich kind of talked about this, but I, honestly, I kind of felt it was danced around a bit. You don't use Ruby gems. Most of the time, you don't want to because they're huge and they're not designed for evented callback-like things. They'll block and, also, and all sorts of things. But even if you did, you can't. So things like active support, uh, pluralizations, and things like that, you can't use that um, because Ruby Motion does not support the require statement. Because um, Ruby Motion there, is not You mentioned that maybe it will require, support require? Well, to do dependency loading. Yeah. Okay, but not, but not to, to pull in third-party gems. Okay, yep. Um, and, and I say, like, again, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean you end up having to re-implement some methods to get some conveniences that you might be used to. Um, and there's, so there's no require, there's no eval. You probably wouldn't want that anyways. Um, this has gotten a lot better, but we have seen, while we were developing Ruby Motion apps, some seriously interesting bugs. Um, so this one, wrong number of arguments, no, negative, what is that, 13 billion something for zero. So clearly I didn't pass enough arguments into that, um, in that method. <laughs> um, it didn't give me a method name or a line number or a backtrace. Um, but, you know, it was fixed. Uh, Laurent uh, fixed it. I think that one was fixed within a week. You know? But that kind of roadblock, because it's a closed source system, I couldn't just dig in and figure out what's going on. Um, so that, that is, you know, something you should be aware of, that you might end up having blockers for a short, short amount of time. Um, and it's moving fast. So um, when we gave a presentation similar to this, that was more just the basics of Ruby Motion yeah. over at uh, Barcelona, Barrico. Yeah. And at that time, um, there were a lot of these bugs. Since then, working on this, I think I've encountered two. One was actually ResKit, and the other one Laurent fixed within a day. So yeah. it is a fast-moving system. And there, there was no debugger support at all originally. So right. you pretty much you were on your own. Now the debugger support, which showed some of it. So yeah. we're looking at things. They're adding features as time goes on. Still, as of this very moment, there is a lack of what I would call strong debugging tools. There is now GDB, which is good. Wait, but hold it's, on. How many people here have actually used GDB? How many have enjoyed it? From the command it? line. With no, OK, good. How many people enjoyed it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course you did, Brian. Brian, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's much better than it used to be. You can use GDB, but you don't get uh, even, even the rudimentary Xcode debugging is way above and beyond what that gives you, right? So Now, like Rich said, there is a company working on uh, yeah. a GUI uh, debugging tool. Is that right? part of the RubyMine? Okay. So RubyMine is working on the, the, the GUI debugging tool if you want to use Ruby. And actually, one other question. Does that debugger include the symbol support? Because that was a big deal. Okay. It does include symbol support. That's good. Um, okay. Uh, I jumped through like three. Okay. The other one is that Coco is huge. When I first heard about Ruby Motion, I'm like, great, I can write Ruby apps. It'll be so simple. And I could just, you know, call whatever. I could use Nokogiri and stuff. No, 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 no. You're still writing a Coco app, and that's the bulk of the pain. Yes, right. and I actually I basically laughed at him and went back to writing stuff in Xcode. <laughs> he likes to write it in C++, so I can listen to him. Um, the other thing is it, it is closed source, uh, so that does mean that, you know, it is a liability, but it is an amazing team that's doing it. Go ahead. Right. So we, I'm, I'm fairly certain that Rich actually has a medical team following Lauren at all times. <laughs> actually, did I hear something about the code being an escrow, Rich? Yeah. So what happens if, if Ruby, what, what happens if HipBite goes under? Okay, I appreciate that. Because there are situations when you're, when you're a larger company licensing somebody else's code that you'll have it in escrow with the knowledge that if that company goes under, if they get bought, something like that, you get the code. It'd be really interesting to see if HipBuy could do something like that for open sourcing the code afterwards, right? Um, Apple. <laughs> it, it is possible to tell that this is a RubyMotion application. Apple, you know, I can't imagine why they would, but they do other things I can't imagine either, so. Like break maps. It's just a small liability, right? Just by the way, realize that 
this entire thing that you're talking about was built on the closed source system. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, no, of course. No, yeah. no, no. no. I, iOS itself is a closed source system, uh, even after Steve Jobs died. <laughs> <laughs> He's not dead. Okay, but here's the good part, it's the glory. You get the expressiveness of Ruby, and it is expressive. This is um, an example of a couple of lines of Objective-C. Oh my God, do I hate the syntax of Objective-C. I actually like the Coco framework because I think it's a well laid out uh, object-oriented framework for development. It's consistent, it's nice. Objective-C is so ugly and painful. So about you've got one, header files. Yeah, about once a day, I just see Tamer pull off his headphones, start screaming and cursing, fuck, 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 and I'm like, I'm like, what's going on? Did something die? What happened? He's like, this makes no sense. And I'll look at his screen and I'll have some, he's trying to type a Ruby method, but it's an objective C method, like, you know, we'll call application with delegate and animation plus your mom. And <laughs> he's basically sitting there cursing at him, I'm like, dude, it's just, it's, this is where you have to remember, it's still objective C you're writing. No matter how much you think you're writing in Ruby, it's still objective C. Right. And here's another example. This is that same table view thing with the, with the reuse of cells. I am not gonna go through how this works because it hurts, right? But it's just, it's so less expressive. It's so hard to understand what's going on. Um, no more Xcode. This is my favorite as well. Uh, this, if it, how many people have followed the, the tumble of uh, um, text, from, text from Xcode? It's hilarious. <laughs> it is great. This, this happened to me on a daily basis. And I, Xcode crashes so hard that it, people are like, well, you need to wipe your Xcode directory and reinstall See, Xcode. Tamer still believes that your dev tools shouldn't troll you. Right. <laughs> I've used Emacs, so I'm not quite sure if that's true. And, and so you can use whatever <sighs> editor you want. You put that slide in, didn't you? Um, so, so you can, <laughs> no, you, I mean, frankly, you're gonna code it in Vim, you're gonna drive it with Rake. That's how a Unix kid does shit. I mean, come yes. on. And it's, it feels great to not have to launch Xcode. The only time you have to launch Xcode is to do that storyboarding stuff and it's not very painful, but this, is, this feels good. Um, and you're using the same language as you use in the back end. You're not gonna reuse a lot of components because like we said, you, know, you can't use gems, you might be able to like cut and paste some stuff, that's about it. But more importantly, you've got the same skill set on the front and the back end and that's actually really important for building a product and building a team. Um, it smooths things out, right? and you've got the ethos of the Ruby community. Very interesting that in Objective-C, you can actually basically do anything you can do in Ruby, with the exception of the fact that Apple won't allow you to avow stuff at runtime, right? But the Objective-C community is just, they're so against anything that's at all magic. They want everything uh, very wet, just very laid out, like repeat it over and over again, because they don't care, just boilerplate, they don't care. Um, Ruby's not like that. And so it's interesting to me to see where some of these libraries are going to go in terms of making things much easier. Yes, in the back. At the same token, I find it odd that you guys are talking about like avoiding abstraction and just using the straight uh, iOS calls as much as possible. I, yeah. I kind of think you're already you already have a lot of code that's going to need to be migrated regardless if you need to go to pure iOS. <coughs> So, so look, just so everybody else can hear, you're saying what you're saying is that why would we be advocating this level of abstraction when they already have to do this? Or? Well, no, he's saying we've already said that we would not encourage this level of abstraction, and now we're talking about how it's a benefit. Oh, well, see, right. okay, here's the difference. What we're not encouraging is a, a level of not understanding what your abstraction abstraction is and when it breaks. So, the perfect example of this is how many people remember the off by one errors, like in Active Record originally, where people would pull back all, and then you'd see all dot first, you know, or all that, and then you have an array index and they'd use the first one. That's a breaking abstraction because people don't understand what they're doing when they do that. It was before scopes, of course. Right, um, and before a -roll. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and also, importantly, um, uh, I'm just conservative. So I think some of these abstractions will become good, maintainable abstractions, but it's always the case that the first ones are abstractions that you cannot build upon. And so we're going to avoid that stuff. That's I mean, how we are. But go ahead, Rich. But what's interesting is the entire talk was about the abstractions built on top of the built-in iOS APIs. Yes. yes. So you went through all of those, mm -hmm. and they're okay abstractions to use, but you don't want to use the pure Ruby abstractions, which you can actually see the source code. For the same reason that I just said, because I'm conservative. RESTKit is a, a very mature library. Say again. No, for, for point two zero, but you could still use the previous version of RESTKit, which yeah, is very and it's stable. totally stable. Um, and you're right though, RESTKit did make a big change yeah, and I wish they had bumped it to a major version when they did that. They should have when they do semantic transitions. The difference between what are you trying to do? Are you trying to build a prototype or are you 
actually trying to push and not in production and you're going to make a lot of money on them. Right. Mm -hmm. Because for instance, I would disagree with what you said about Overwrap. I think Overwrap is actually what you should be using at the beginning the first time you want to use HTTP. But as you get something more complex, then you might need more reliability, more users using the, the, the libraries, you might want to use something that's using the yes. that, That's a decent point. That can you summarize? Yeah, his summary is, he, it is possible to view Ruby Motion as a prototyping tool, um, and then maybe it will build with you, but if you're doing that, you should start with the simplest thing, and, and uh, he posits that his library is the simplest thing, bubble wrap. Who's speaking over here? Oh. <laughs> so no, and so the other thing is to remember is that Objective-C has a much longer history in terms of its level of abstraction um, than Ruby. Just bear with me on that. I know that's a little contentious, right? But the delegate patterns and the way they do use MVC is literally hard-coded into the Cocoa APIs. You have to remember, Objective-C is the language in which you write a Cocoa application, right? You can write one in C++, right? You just flip the switch and you can actually do it in C++. You know, it will be upon your head if you do it, but it's, you could. Um, so the thing to remember is that you actually have to learn Cocoa and you have to understand what Cocoa expects your abstractions to be. And if you fight against it, you're just going to have a world of hurt. So which is one of the reasons why, for instance, you go you basically use the abstraction that Cocoa provides much more often than you use the abstractions that Ruby or even something like Rails would provide. All right, so, right, so the question is production versus demo or internal tool. Now, when we gave this talk three months ago, I said, um, I think this will be production ready, like Thunderbolt Labs, a very conservative development shop, would use this for a client application in maybe six months. And that's how things are progressing. That was about three months ago, yeah. right? And at this point, it's, it's actually progressed faster. Still not sure if we would use this for a client application where we had to hand it off to client developers at this point, but it's certainly getting closer. So, um, right. Uh, so we also, we're writing a book, uh, an ebook on doing Ruby Motion with REST kits. It's gonna be done in about two weeks to a month. Um, if you wanna see uh, example code and uh, more in-depth uh, details of how to do some of the more advanced stuff with ResKit. Just follow Thunderbolt Labs on Twitter and we'll announce it there. And that's it. I don't think we have any time for questions. We're a little over, but actually maybe we can take one. Yeah, okay, nobody's gonna stop me. Go ahead. Do no optics respond uh, with quietly with Ruby Motion? Do they follow that pattern because if you call them that's on? No, you, you, you really um, yeah, oh, yeah, do null objects respond quietly with the Ruby motion? No, it will raise us. Uh, if you try and call a method on a null object, you'll get um, the normal Ruby exception on that. So it tries to stick to Ruby as much as possible. Just so you know, the, the pattern in Objective C is because you can dynamically attach methods using selectors. In Objective C, if you call on a null selector, it's not considered an error, right? If you can train my Ruby on your laptop, it's free and open source. It will be exactly the same here. Yes. Yeah. yeah, if you use Mac Ruby on your laptop, um, that's the same. Uh, it's the same Ruby semantics as uh, Ruby Motion. Any anyway. other questions? Sounds like that's it. So thanks. Thank Ruby. you very much. Yeah.